Thanks for coming uh, on this nice warm morning. Uh, my name is Rick Kern, and uh, I am from the University of California, Berkeley, uh, where I'm a professor in the French department, and I'm also the director of the Berkeley Language Center, which works with language teachers from all the 60 or so languages that uh, are taught on the Berkeley campus. And today um, and tomorrow, uh, we're going to be talking about texts um, in a very broad sense, uh, because texts are so important to all learning, not just in languages, but in all disciplines. Uh, most of our learning is mediated through texts. And it's particularly important in foreign languages because we're dealing with other cultural systems, other ideological systems, uh, other symbolic systems. And so texts are uh, an incredibly important source of learning. Uh, particularly important in, in foreign language. And so the, the goal of this workshop is to sort of explore some of the dynamics of what happens uh, in textuality uh, as texts are mediated in different ways through different media. Uh, and we'll be looking at paper texts. We'll be looking at filmic texts. We'll be looking at pho photographic texts, music texts, uh, art texts. Uh, and then... Um, what, uh, how we can exploit these different uh, potentials uh, in the classroom. I'd like to talk about is, is, is mediation in a very broad sense and how this plays out in uh, language learning and how we can take advantage of this. Uh, and not only in terms of our specific language uh, that we teach, whether that's French, German, Chinese, Japanese, etc., cetera, um, and how specific features of texts uh, can help us learn about the culture, learn about the language and so forth, learn about discourse uh, practices, social practices in that, in that, that are common in that culture, but also uh, how mediation works in a, beyond specific languages. So sort of studying language with a capital L so that our students, whether it's the primary, secondary, or tertiary level, have some what I'm calling critical semiotic awareness of how meaning is made through texts in a very broad sense, not only in the case of specific languages, but across languages as well. Because as I'll try to explain in the next two days, I think that's a very important part of language education, not just the specific ability to be proficient in a language, but to have a certain semiotic proficiency in understanding how uh, we make meanings through text, through discourse, and how when we create texts, they can then be remediated or recontextualized, hence the title textualization and recontextualization, which I'll explain in just a minute, and how when we put things in a new context, all of a sudden they take on new values. And this is particularly important in foreign language because when we read a foreign language text, these are always recontextualized because they weren't written for foreign language learners. All of a sudden now, they're being put in a new context and they're being, being read for new purposes uh, by audience, by people who are not the intended readers. And this puts a very different slant on the text and what meanings will be uh, made from the text and so forth. So dynamics of textuality is sort of the, the, the three theme that will be running through this. And so to this morning, what I'd like to do is focus on um, some particular ways uh, that we can get students more actively involved in reading and writing in class, not just outside of class. Because typically what happens is that students do a lot of spoken practice in class and then the teacher says, okay, for tomorrow, I'd like you to read pages 65 through 90 of your textbook, your reader, your work of literature, whatever it is. And then tomorrow, we'll discuss it in class. So we'll come back, we'll convene, and we'll discuss it. And then you'll go home, and you'll write a paper about it. So the problem with that is that the reading and the writing gets pushed to the out-of-class, at-home, alone time. And students often say that reading and writing are the hardest aspects. Uh, and they feel like they're uh, on their own to deal with this hardest aspect. So the idea here is to try and bring, not all the time, but to bring in reading and writing into the classroom so that that can be an active part of classroom activity 
to become more aware of the kinds of things, the kinds of processes that are so important to their reading and writing ability and to be able to then give them a scaffold that they can use when they are at home on their own. But they, now they've got a social structure that they, can, that they can bring to that solitary experience at home, which will support them. So that's the, that's the goal. And we're going to also look at ways that uh, we can sort of move this order around so that we might, in fact, write about a work that we're going to read before we've even read it. Now, that seems paradoxical. How can you write about something that you haven't even read yet? Well, the idea is that if we want students to get certain things out of, say, a piece of literature, we may have to activate some ideas ahead of time that will make them more receptive, more sensitive to seeing, perceiving those ideas when they encounter the text. And and writing is a great way of doing that. So that's an overview of some of the things we'll be doing uh, this morning. But before we get into that, I want to uh, back up a little bit. Um, a lot of what we're going to be talking about has to do with technology. We're not going to be talking about computers, per se, but we're going to be talking about technology because all textualization is a question of tex- technology. So if we go back dozens of thousands of years ago to the caves of Lascaux and, and other prehistoric uh, art, we've got cave paintings that were early texts about hunting, uh, about food gathering, and so forth. Now, these were not linguistic texts. But if we go to about 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, now we have the birth of of linguistic texts. And this is where technology and language intersect, because now we have the ability to make language durable. We can come back to it. We can pass it along to someone else. We can take time to scrutinize it. We can think about reworking it. We can think about how this could be modified by swapping this symbol here, this symbol there. This gives us an amazing flexibility when it comes to sign making, when it comes time, when it comes to thinking uh, about language and thinking in general. So in this case, this is a cuneiform uh, clay tablet, which was one of the early language textbooks. What this is is a lexical list, and uh, this was used to teach cuneiform writing to nascent scribes. Uh, And the idea was that they would have this tablet, which lists different types of professions, wooden objects, birds, small animals, and they would then copy these cuneiform signs onto their own tablet, uh, which was, this was hardened obviously, but they would be writing in soft clay, uh, and then the teacher would see how they were doing uh, in copying these these, uh, cuneiform signs. So, The idea here is is that you are now taking language and making a record of that language that can then be passed on uh, to others. A more flexible writing tool was the wax tablet. And the wax tablet was used probably longer than any other writing device so far in history, far longer than paper. Uh, And the idea is it's really a word processor because with the pointed end, you would write in the beeswax uh, and you would have, uh, you could either dictate a text and your scribe would write it out or you would write it yourself, which was less common. Uh, But the idea was when you're done performing, usually performing the text in some kind of speech, you would then wipe the beeswax uh, with the dull end of the stylus and you'd be able to start all over again. Or if you wanted to swap out a word, you would just erase it with your uh, blunt end of the stylus. So you have a fantastic writing tool that allows you to modify, to textualize discourse, but then to modify that discourse. You're not 
literally in stone anymore. Uh, you're not in clay that hardens. Now you've got a, a malleable uh, material. And you'll notice that the way the clay tablets were uh, hollowed out of these wood plaques that were then tied together, this was the model for the codex, uh, the, 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 the book that uh, then developed out of the wax tablet, where now we have access to all these different pages. We have random access to uh, information. So all of these different tools have uh, different affordances. And in the last 100 years, 150 years, we have more and more tools. So there's a, there's a rapid accumulation of textualization tools, whether it's film or audio recording, writing tools like typewriters. Uh, and then all of these now have been remediated in the computer, which treats everything as binary data, whether it's sound, video, text, which gives us incredible flexibility in terms of um, acting on texts. Because now, as numeric data, they can be put through algorithms that transforms uh, texts in interesting ways. So the, the, the computer is kind of the ultimate recontextualizer. So let's take a look at some of the principles behind this process of extracting discourse and making it durable. A few points uh, that we can make. The first one is that, is that textualization realigns uh, reality along new lines of space uh, and time. So, for example, uh, you can juxtapose, whether it's in film or in linguistic text, you can juxtapose scenes that were not juxtaposed in reality. You can reorganize a sequence of events, uh, starting with a flashback uh, and then moving to something that was uh, much, much later. Uh, you can jump around uh, in time. You can jump around in space in ways that you can't do in face-to-face -face, uh, experience. So, so the experience of reading or viewing the text may be entirely different from the experience that one had uh, from the original experience that was textualized. Second point is uh, that uh, you make an event identifiable as the same uh, with each viewing. So you're stabilizing uh, an event or some kind of propositional content. Um, and so we've, we've sort of carved out this content uh, out of the flow of time and we've imposed certain arbitrary boundaries. So there's a start point and there's a stop point uh, when, we, when we textualize something. Whereas in lived experience, it's much more of a flow. We can't really say that there was a, an absolute discrete start point and a discrete ending point. That's something that we impose as text makers. So that's another feature of textualization. Third point, uh, dissociates the meaning of an event from both the participants and the author's uh, intentions. Um, and so the, the meaning of the event uh, is, is now um, not, not officially established by the author or uh, so much as by those who are um, given the authority to be the interpreters. Uh, of the text. And this is an interesting point in relation to what we were just talking about, uh, about the history of, of uh, texts. Uh, and that is uh, how when learning became, uh, I mean, it used to be that teachers were the font of all knowledge and that any other materials were secondary, but the teacher was the central source. But when, when everything became highly text-based, teachers became the interpreters of text, and text take, took on an authority uh, that they had not had previously. Uh, and so it changed the dynamic between student and teacher. So as technologies uh, change, it, it does affect the kinds, and so it's interesting to think these days with computers, how does that affect the relationship uh, between student and teacher? 
what, what are the new uh, dynamics? And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, tomorrow. Um, fourth point uh, extends the importance um, of an event or content beyond its relevance to its initial situation. Um, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the idea here being that uh, with each audience, new meanings are attributed to that event that may be very different meanings from than those that were generated at the moment of the experience itself by those who were physically present. If for no other reason, because the viewers or the readers of the text probably were not there. They're seeing it just on the basis of the text alone. And then the last point um, is that textualization makes the event or experience accessible to multiple unpredictable and changing audiences. So uh, with each viewing or reading, the text takes on additional layers of, of meaning for each viewer with each time the, the text is replayed or uh, reread. So those are a few ideas that we'll be working with textualization. Now, recontextualization is the idea is that once you, you've created a text, that uh, this can now be reframed, which means that it will generate new meanings. Um, and we'll see how this operates uh, in a number of examples uh, this morning. But uh, just to go back to what we talked about earlier, foreign language texts, uh, that is a situation where the text was written by an author for a particular audience. Uh, now a foreign language reader sitting in a class at U of A picks up that work and is reading it and talking about it in a foreign language class. That is an entirely different context from the one that the author may have intended or that the book is traditionally used for in the social community for which it was produced in the first place. So the kinds of practices and the kinds of meanings that are born from that use of the text in the U of A classroom may be very different. It has now been recontextualized a classic example is the study of the Quran. So if you're in a religious studies class and you are looking at this with a religious studies viewpoint, you are looking at the Quran from a very different standpoint than you are from a practicing Muslim where recitation is the practice associated uh, and you don't sit around talking about, discussing, uh, the Quran. Uh, it's an, that's an entirely different social practice that is one that comes out of academia, but not out of Islam, Islamic practices. So the text may be the same, but it's being used in an entirely different way for different purposes. In fact, for illegitimate purposes, if you use the frame of Islamic practice, that would be a very inappropriate, illegitimate use of the Quran to be sitting around talking about uh, the text as a, as, a, as a work of literature, for example. Okay, so, um, and then uh, this can give rise to new meanings. Right, okay. So let's take a look at a text that is both linguistic and non-linguistic. This is uh, a photograph that I took waiting for a tram in Grenoble, France. And this is, they have these little kiosk type things with ads. So the original text is this Nokia cell phone ad. And it's advertising the Nokia 6230. And it says, I've got 64 emails to send. And then on the screen, you may not be able to see it very well, but it's this very idyllic cove, probably in the south of France somewhere, that looks very inviting. And it says, je plonge. So I'm going I'm to dive in. So I'm going to dive into this beautiful water. I'm going to dive into my emails. But it's going to be such a pleasure. 
to send these emails on my little Nokia cell phone. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the advertisement. So now what this technology protester has done is has scrawled across here, jette ton portable. He's saying, throw away your cell phone. Okay. So we have the publicist that's making an ad. We have the protester that is saying, down with cell phones, down with technology, throw your cell phone away. And then we have the pedagogue that comes along <laughs> and his, makes a second graffiti on here and says, oh, you idiot, don't you know that in the second person imperative, you delete the S. So no S on jette ton portable. Okay. So what's interesting here is we have three layers of discourse that in sort of a, a spoken, any kind of spoken interaction would have to take place in time over a, a sequence. You know, someone presents an ad, someone says, ah, oh, blah, 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 and then there's a correction of that. But here it's all simultaneous. It's all superimposed. And so you get these happening uh, at the same time. As you see the ad, you're also seeing the graffiti, both sets of graffiti all together. So this superimposition is very complex. Uh, three modes of discourse all happening simultaneously. And what happens, so, so this is a, a text that's been recontextualized uh, in the sense that now we have additional layers of discourse that make us see the original text in a very different way. And what happens is uh, now if you go out and see the original ad without any graffiti, you, you open up a magazine, there will be traces of this graffiti that will come to mind. Oh, I remember seeing this ad marked up with a bunch of... No, that's indelible. You can't go back to sort of your virgin ad with no overlay of meaning. These sets of graffiti have now become imprinted on your representation of, of that text. So the idea here is that as you add layers of discourse, you can't really go back to what was there. And this is what happens all the time when uh, we're reading texts uh, and discuss them in class. Things that now come to light now become the new starting point. Uh, you can't really go back to the way things were before. It just, when you see the text and these uh, associations are automatic. Uh, 